You are now listening to episode two of Dracula, a radio play, presented by the Porqua Pa Players and CHMR 93.5 FM. This episode is written by Karen Murray Burquist, based on the novel by Bram Stoker, and is directed by Hannah Tuck. We hope you enjoy. Diary of Lucy Westenra. I must take up keeping a journal, like Nina. Then we can have long talks when we do meet. I wish you were with me again, for I feel so unhappy. Last night I seemed to be dreaming again, just as I was at Whitby. Perhaps it is the change of air or getting home again. I can remember nothing, but I am full of vague fear, and I feel so weak and worn out. I tried to keep awake and succeeded for a while, but when the clock struck 12, it waked me from a doze, so I must have been falling asleep. There was a sort of scratching or flapping at the window. This morning I am horribly weak. My face is ghastly pale and my throat pains me. It must be something wrong with my lungs for I don't seem ever to get air enough. I shall try to cheer up when Arthur comes or else I know he will be miserable to see me so. There must be Dr. Seward with the foreign doctor friend he mentioned. I must screw my courage to the sticking place and face them. Dr. Seward and Professor Van Helsing. Miss Westenra, allow me to introduce you to my friend and mentor, Abraham Van Helsing. I am pleased to meet you, Professor, but the doctor does me an injustice. I have told him more than once that he must call me Lucy, and so must you. If you wish. Now, Miss Lucy, I am summoned by our friend John, who tells me you are in low spirits. We will show him he is wrong. As I told Eartha, I am quite all right, just a little tired now and again. <laughs> he worries too much. But so does Mother, so I've made sure she's lunching out today and won't know anything of this. Hmm. I think I ought to ask you some questions. Will you allow it? You cannot understand how much I loathe talking about myself, but it was good of you to come so quickly and offer your help. It was for a debt I owe him from a time when he acted with such swiftness and saved my life. Really? Tell me about it. Miss Lucy, I see you exaggerated not when you said how little you liked to talk of yourself. But if you will once let me ask you the questions a doctor must ask, I will let you ask what questions you will in return. Now, I think Dr. Seward must leave us. What can he know of the troubles of young maidens? The young do not tell themselves to the young, only to the old, like me, who have known so many sorrows and the causes of them. He shall take a stroll in the garden or smoke a cigarette, which he must not do in here, lest he plague you with smoke. But, but Professor... You, my best student, must leave doctor and patient together. Why do you only call me that when you're trying to get rid of me? What do you think? I have examined her and asked questions of her maid, but I have no conclusions yet. We must observe her carefully to find out the cause of disease, for there is always cause, even if we know it not. I will keep an eye on her over the next few days. Mm. I must return to Amsterdam. You will send me the telegram every day to say how young Miss gets on, and if there is cause, I will come back. Thank you, Professor. It was good of you to come so swiftly. For your sake, I was glad to. For yours and hers both, I would do what I can to help. Dear Art, I trust your poor father is rallying. Zoophagus patient still keeps up our interest in him. He had only one outburst, and that was around noon. What am I doing? I've written my journal into Art's letter. This is what long work hours do to a person. But I should see how Renfield is. Then finish the letter. Then sleep. In that order. Well, Renfield, how are you feeling? All over. All over. He has deserted me. Who deserted you? Don't ask me. Uh, I'm sorry for my bad conduct earlier, Doctor. Uh, won't you be very good and uh, let me have a little more sugar? Why do you want sugar? I think it would be good for me. <laughs> and the flies. Yes, the, f the flies like it, and <laughs> I like the flies, so I like it. Very well. I will bring you some sugar later tonight. And people say madmen don't argue. Midnight. Another change in him. 
I was standing at our own gate, looking at the sunset, and once more I heard him yelling. It was a shock to me to turn from the wonderful, smoky beauty of a sunset over London, and to realise all the grim sternness of my own cold stone building, with its wealth of breathing misery, and my own desolate heart to endure it all. I reached him just as the sun was going down, and just as it dipped below the horizon, he slid from the hands that held him, an inert mass on the floor. It is wonderful, however, what intellectual recuperative power lunatics have, for within a few minutes he stood up quite calmly and looked around him. I signalled to the attendants not to hold him, for I was anxious to see what he would do. Enough! Fly away and leave me alone! What? Are you not going to keep flies anymore? Nor eat them, apparently. No! I'm sick of that rubbish! I wish I could get some glimpse of his mind. Can it be that there is a malign influence of the sun at periods which affects certain natures, as at times the moon does others? We shall see. You have written to the fiancé, Mr. Holmwood? Right after I telegraphed you. I told him Lucy was worse when I came in to check on her, but I, I don't know if he's read it or if he can even come down. He's at Ring, caring for his father. I don't know how she could have relapsed so badly. She was looking so well. And her mother? What does she know? As little as I could tell her. The poor woman would have a bad shock if she knew how serious the case was, and that might kill her. But she could hardly escape knowing Lucy is ill. She must have blood. There is not time to be lost. She will die for sheer want of blood to keep the heart's motion as it should be. Is it you or me? It must be me, Professor. Roll up your sleeve. It is lucky I have instruments for a transfusion in my case. Arthur! Jack, I've been in agony. I read between the lines of your letter. Father was better, so I came down as quickly as I could. How is Lucy? You must be the young lover. Arthur Holmwood, at your service and ever in your debt. You could hardly have been quicker to answer our call, and for that I thank you, Dr. Van Helsing. Sir, you have come in time. She is bad. Very bad. Oh, heavens! Nay, my child, do not faint. John, bring him that chair. You are to help her. Save her, indeed. What can I do? What must I do? My life is hers, and I would give the last drop of my blood in my body for her. You need not give that much. I do not ask the last drop. Only a little. Beg pardon? A transfusion must be done. Oh, of course. Where shall I sit? You shall sit here, by her bedside, and we shall work with all haste. Sit! Miss Lucy is asleep still, under the effect of the opiate I administered. She will need watching tonight. The young lover is away to regain his strength. You must stay here. What do you make of the mark on her throat? What do you make of it? I can make nothing of it. It looks painful, yet it could not possibly be the means of so much blood being lost. You have trusted me long, my friend, and I have not disappointed you. Now you must trust me again, and know that I am working for the health of her whom you love. Love? I... Your face is not one to conceal anything, but now I must return to Amsterdam, for there are books and things I want. What kind of things? Questions, questions that need answers. And my good friend John, let me caution you. You deal with the madmen. All men are mad in some way or the other. And inasmuch as you deal discreetly with your madmen, so deal with God's madmen too, the rest of the world. You tell not your madmen what you do, nor why you do it. You tell them not what you think. I have for myself thoughts at the present. Later, I shall unfold to you. Can you not unfold to me now? At least tell me what I must do to help Lucy. Take note of all, as you used to do, and do not hesitate to think what it may mean. You were always a careful student, and your case book was ever more full than the rest. I counsel you now. Resume your old habit and put down even your doubts and surmises. Nothing is too small. I'll keep careful notes, but... You must remain with her all night, and you must not let your sight pass from her. See that she is well fed and that nothing disturbs her. You must not sleep all the night. This is life and death, perhaps more. What on earth do you mean? We shall see. 
Remember, she is your charge. If you leave her and harm befall, you shall not sleep easy hereafter. There you are, John. I was just hoping you'd come in and help me stay awake. You do not want to sleep? No. I am afraid. Afraid to go to sleep? Why so? It is the boon we all crave for. Not if you were like me. If sleep was to you a presage of horror. What do you mean? I don't know. Oh, I, I don't know. That's what makes it so terrible. But all this weakness comes to me in sleep until I dread the very thought. Tonight, I am here watching you and I'll make sure nothing can happen. Thank you. If I see any evidence of bad dreams, I will wake you at once. Please do. I will sleep if you promise. I promise you that. Another toast. Welcome home, my dear Mr. and Mrs. Harker. What a joy it is to see you in England once again. Thank you for having us to dinner, Mr. Hawkins. Uh, Now, my dears, no standing on ceremony. I'm sorry I couldn't be there to see you married. You are the nearest I have to children of my own, and I wish I could have seen the joyous occasion. We received your letter the following day. It was hardly the wedding either of us expected, though it was perfect. It was. Now, though it is a little delayed, I wish to drink your health and prosperity. May every blessing attend you both. And your health also. Speaking of my health, I'm afraid I have some rather serious matters to speak of tonight. It isn't only for the pleasure of seeing you that I have asked you to come over. Is something the matter, sir? Oh, no, no. Well, not in the immediate. You know I haven't been well of late, and should my days be shorter than my hopes, I would like you both to be well provided for. I have left you everything. Jonathan, you will be a full partner and have the firm when I am gone. Oh, Oh. sir, that is too generous. Uh, None of that, my boy. My firm will be in good hands, and that's enough for me. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. And there's one more thing. I know you've been saving up to make a home of your own, but I would, if you accept it, like you to make a home here with me. Live here? That would be marvelous. That's terribly kind of you. Will you take up residency in this house? What, I... Yes, I I would love to. Mina, my love, would that suit you? Wonderfully. Very well. Will you have you settled in tomorrow? For now, your rooms are all made up, so I dare say you'll want a good night's rest. What dreadful weather. <laughs> what a relief it is to be back in the dreadful English weather. It reminds me of Whitby. Oh... Is something the matter? I'm just a little worried about Lucy, that's all. I ought to write to her. Why not run up to London for the day? You could see her in person. Perhaps soon, but for now there's too much to do. I'm not going to leave you to face all your new duties alone. Thank you, my dear. Think nothing of it. My shorthand will be put to the test. But I will write to Lucy, tonight. Give her my esteemed compliments? No, that's too formal. Give her my respectful duty. (laughs) Is that good enough from the junior partner of the important firm of Hawkins and Harker? (laughs) And so, as you love me, and he loves me, and I love you with all the moods and tenses of the verb, I send you simply his love instead. Goodbye, my dearest Lucy, and all blessings on you. You must sleep, Lucy. I'll keep watch. Oh no, none of that. You look like you haven't slept in weeks. If you're afraid, I'll make you the same promise as I did last time. I am only afraid you will exhaust yourself from watching over me at night. I am quite well, I assure you. But indeed I am, and if there is to be any sitting up, it is I who will sit up with you. Come and have supper with me, and then you can lie on the couch for the night. Don't protest. I promise that if I want anything, I shall call out, and you can come to me at once. Will you promise to sleep if I do? I solemnly swear. And how is our patient? Well, when I left, when I left her, Professor, when did you get back from Amsterdam? Doctors, come quickly! It's Miss Lucy. Oh God, I should never have slept. 
We found her looking pale as death and couldn't wake her. God in himmel. Quick, bring the brandy. Yes, doctor. It's not too late. We must another transfusion make. Let me. It's my fault she needs it. Sit here. Now, hold still, my friend, while these instruments do their work. The ghastly paraphernalia of our beneficial trade. Good. You remember my lecturing. What could have caused this twice in a row? She was looking so much better. It is loss of blood, as you see. But if she were losing this much in one night, the sheets would be crimson. Then we must seek another explanation. But we must work with speed. She is threatened, as she has never been before by death. And worse, too. Worse? I will tell you soon, my friend. I wish you would tell me straight away, for nothing about her illness seems to make sense. You must observe for yourself. Keep an open mind. See, already the roses in her cheeks return. No man knows, till he has felt it, what it is to feel his own lifeblood drawn away into the veins of the woman he loves. Are you well? Perfectly. There. We will stop now. Already? You took a great deal more from Art. He is fiancé. You are her doctor with work to do to help Miss Lucy by the arts of our profession. But how are we to help her? What do we do next? Oh, I shouldn't have stood up so fast. You should get a glass of wine and lie down. Then have breakfast. And we must have none to know what has been happening here. I have grave reasons. No, do not ask them. Think what you will. Do not fear to think even the most not probable. Dr. Seward? Lucy, I'm so sorry. No, no, don't move. It's all right, but you need to rest. Did I sleep at all? Did you? I I feel exhausted. All is in hand, Miss Lucy. It is only an unexpected reversal. You have the strength of friends to aid you. Oh, Doctor, how is the poor dear? We mustn't overtax her, Mrs. Westenra. She needs rest, but she should be quite well if we allow her to sleep and rally her strength. We owe you so much for all you've done, but you really must now take care not to overwork yourself. You are looking pale yourself. You want a wife to nurse you and look after you a bit. That you do. (laughs) Mother. Don't look so shocked. Can I have the maids bring you anything? Cup of tea? I I think we're quite all right. I see the indignation has put colour in your cheeks again, young miss, and that is good. The doctor must return to his usual patience, but he will be here tomorrow. Take some rest, Lucy. I'm sorry. Let me see you out, doctor, and you can tell me all about your work. How are the madmen? I have brought with me a parcel, and if my surmise has been not false, this will be medicine for you. Flowers for me? How lovely. Now, Miss Lucy, you must wear these flowers. They are not an ornament. They are for your help. I will put a garland of them at the windows and on the sill. If you keep them and wear them, neither I nor John must stay with you tonight, and you may sleep easy. I don't see how they... (laughs) Why, they're only common garlic. (laughs) Dear doctor, surely you do not mean to tell me they have medicinal properties. But, Miss Lucy, I do. They are vital to your treatment. And that is all I will tell you now. Though, when you are recovered, I may tell you more that you will understand. Couldn't you tell me all? I'm burning to know. Not yet, but soon. You must rest tonight. Very well. Be as mysterious as you like. But with all of this, I could swear you are working some spell, protecting me against evil spirits. And perhaps I am. You... You're jesting. About the flowers? No, I never jest. You must wear them. It is a very serious matter. I trust you, but it does seem very odd. I suppose everything has been odd lately. If they can keep me off the bad dreams, I am more than happy to wear them. You must not remove them, even if the room feel close. You must keep them about you. I promise. Cross my heart. I feel like Ophelia, all surrounded by these flowers. But they are rather nice. What have I done to be blessed with such friends? Come in! I thought I should ask if I might sit up tonight. You've done so much for us, Doctor, and I'm willing to help if I can. 
but is kind and generous. I will not refuse when there is need, but tonight that is not so. Will you be all right, miss? Of course. Thank you, but I'll be quite fine. If I need anything, I will call. Good. Now I will return tomorrow to see you recovered. You'll find me at a game of tennis. Master, what must I do? Why did you not let me in? No, he is here, but he will not come to me. His most faithful servant. No hope for me now, unless I do it myself. Dr. Seward, as you requested, I kept an eye on Renfield overnight. Ah, any change? The same attack as at sunset, like before. It's a hard job calming down the other patients afterward when he starts yelling like that. He's been talking about his lord and master, and he's staring out the window, fixated on something outside. The abbey that he ran away to the time he escaped? Yes, but he hasn't resumed collecting flies or anything else since getting rid of the ones he had. And I trust no further escape attempts? I would have told you that. Of course. If you'll excuse me, Doctor, I have a few things that need attending. You'll let me know if there's any change. Naturally. So lovely to see you, doctors. But you needn't have come, really, for Lucy's so much better this morning. I rejoice to hear our methods have done some good. Is she about? Uh, She's sleeping. And don't take all the credit for her improvement. I was anxious about the dear child during the night, and when I went in, all her room was filled with such smelly flowers. I took them all out and opened the window, so the poor thing might have some air. You you opened... Oh, good God, that we might not be too late! Mrs. Westenra, I believe we must have a moment alone with the patient. Please excuse us. You can at least thank me! She looks so much worse. How can she have worsened so much in a single night? God, 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 how the powers of the devils work against us. This poor mother, all unknowing and all for the best, as she thinks, does such thing as lose her daughter, body and soul. And we must not tell her, or even warn her, for she die, and then both die. Oh, God! Dr. Van Helsing, I beg you, for Lucy's sake, for Lucy's sake, we must bear up. Devils, or no devils, or all the devils at once. It matters not. She needs once again blood. Then let me. No. Today you must operate. I shall provide. You are weakened already. I'll stay with her again tonight. Stay with her, friend John. Make sure that the flowers are not removed. Seventeenth September. Four days and nights of peace. I am getting so strong again that I hardly know myself. It is as if I had passed through some long nightmare and I just awakened to feel the fresh air of the morning. I have a dim half-remembrance of long, anxious times of waiting and fearing. Darkness in which there was not even the pain of hope to make present distress more poignant. And then long spells of oblivion and the rising back to life as a diver coming up through a great press of water. Since, however, Dr. Van Helsing has been with me, all this bad dreaming seems to have passed away. I have grown quite fond of the garlic. Tonight I have no fear of sleep, and I am well enough to be left alone. 17th September. Thank goodness Van Helsing has not summoned me tonight. I have enough to do here, not to mention sleep, if I can. I am beginning to wonder if long hours among the insane are beginning to tell on my brain. Renfield, what are you doing? Where did you get a knife? Give that to me, Renfield. Oh, that, that's quite deep. But he's no longer trying to attack. What is he doing? The blood is life. Dr. Seward, I heard shouting and, and thought I'd better... Oh, dear God, what's happened? Dr. Hennessy, please bring the patient back to his room. He's dropped the knife, but be careful. Is that your blood? I'll be fine once I bind up my wrist. Oh, come on, Renfield. Come on. Come up off the floor. Why are you... Why are you... Oh, God, how revolting. Blood. The blood is life. The blood is life. Please ensure he does not drink any more blood. 
I'm just going to sit down a moment. Come with me back to your room now. Up you get. Come on now. <laughs> the blood is life. And do not disturb me tonight. I think I may need rest. Dr. Seward! A telegram for Dr. Seward? Oh, should I put it on the desk? My dearest Lucy, such a sad blow has befallen us. Mr. Hawkins has died very suddenly. We had both come to so love him that it really seems as though we have lost a father. I knew neither father nor mother, so that the dear old man's death is a real blow to me. Jonathan is greatly distressed. It is not only that he feels sorrow, deep sorrow, for the man who has treated him like his own son, but the amount of responsibility which it puts upon him makes him nervous. I try to cheer him up, and my belief in him helps him to have a belief himself. But it is here that the grave shock that he experienced tells upon him the most. Forgive me, dear, if I worry you with my troubles in the midst of your own happiness, but I must tell someone, for the strain of keeping up a brave and cheerful appearance to Jonathan tries me, and I have no one here to confide in. I dread coming up to London, as we must do for poor Mr. Hawkins is to be buried in a grave with his father. I shall try to run over to see you, dearest. With all my blessings, Mina. How is it we arrive at the same time? Did you not get my telegram? Your telegram was delivered late. They sent it to the wrong address. I came as soon as I read it. I fear what we may find inside. Dear God, if that sweet girl has been hurt in any way. Why does no one answer? Look, there is an open window. We must make our entrance there. Lucy? Lucy, Mrs. Westenra. In here. Help me wake the maids. They are in the dining room asleep. It smells of laudanum. The decanter. Someone's drugged them. Wake them if you can, and have them help us. I will seek for Miss Lucy. Oh, my head. What happened? Don't be afraid. I'll help you up. Dr. Seward? What's going on? We need hot water and blankets for Miss Lucy. We need you to help us. What happened? Tell me what happened. There's no time. We need your help now. If you can stoke the fire and you can bring more blankets, we may yet be able to help her, but we need to hurry. In here! Is that Mrs. Westenra, laid out under that sheet? Alas, yes. For her, we have come too late. But here is Miss Lucy beside her. She's still breathing. She isn't beyond our help. Not yet, friend John. We must hasten if we are to save her life. And more than that, too. More than that? Never mind, explain it later. We must keep her warm. Get her into the bed while I fetch the brandy. The maids are fetching blankets. Lucy, Lucy, can you hear me? What's this? Ah, her heart beats again more strong. But we must not let this victory go to our heads. We need blood. Blood or she will die. Let me. No. You are exhausted. I am exhausted. We need someone fresh, strong, who has slept well last night, who has strength to give to her in blood. Will man do? Uh, Quincy Morris, how long have you been there? Just arrived. Uh, Heard you fellas talking about blood? Well, I have plenty to give, so tell me which sleeve I ought to roll up. The left, please, and sit here at the side of Miss Lucy's bed. What on earth brought you? Telegram from Art. He sounded agitated. I I guess it was for a good reason. You've come just in the nick of time. How is it you always do that? Miss Lucy, if she is cursed in the foes that beset her, is at least fortunate in the friends who come to her help. Professor, I don't want to shove myself in anywhere where I have no right to be, but I recognize I'm I'm as anxious as the both of you about Miss Lucy. You said the two of you were exhausted already. This isn't the first time this has happened, is it? No. You are the fourth man to open his veins. Do not look so shocked, friend John. We may trust this man with such matters now that he is a part of them. How long has this been going on? Ten days. Ten days? And four transfusions? A man alive, it's a wonder her body could hold all that blood. There, we have taken enough. Friend John, take our brave friend to drink a glass of wine and lie down. You know, when I was in the Pampas, 
Uh, I, I had a mare I was fond of get fed on by one of those great bats they, they call vampires. She was so weak, she couldn't stand. I had to put a bullet in her. Uh, now, I haven't seen anything get pulled down so quick since then. But seeing Lucy like that, Jack, tell me straight, what's going on? She was looking so well, but I should have been here watching her last night. What's happened to her anyhow? A loss of blood. I figured as much, Jack, but what took it out? I don't know. I don't have the slightest idea, and I'm at my wit's end. Well, I'll stay here as long as I'm needed. You and the Dutchman tell me what needs doing, and I'll do it. Thank you. Take some rest, and I'll tell you how Lucy is. Come in. She sleeps still. She's still so pale. Will she rally? My friend, it is far too precarious to know, for she is weakened, not just by this, but by every other night. But I can see there is another question in your mind. What do you want to tell me? When I was lifting her into bed, something fell out of her nightdress. This paper. Memorandum left by Lucy Westenra, 17th September. I write this and leave it to be seen so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. This is an exact record of what took place tonight. I feel I'm dying of weakness and I've barely strength to write. But it must be done if I die in the doing. I can't sleep. The flapping at the window is back. Just when I thought it was over and I would be done with my nightmares at last, I suppose I spoke too soon. Is anyone there? Lucy, are you not asleep? Oh, Mother, I I didn't wake you, did I? I was uneasy about you, darling. I came in to see that you were all right. I'm fine, only having a little trouble getting to sleep. I thought you weren't feeling well. Don't fret about that now. You need to keep your own spirits up. I hate to see you troubled. Come, lie down and put a blanket over so you don't catch a cold. All right, I'll only stay a short time. I see you've put the flowers back up. You know Dr. Van Helsing insisted on and I rather like the smell now. What was that? I... I... I don't... (laughs) Mother? Mother, please, speak to me. I, I, I can't rise. Mother, can't you hear me? Oh, what happened? The flowers, they're fallen. Miss Lucy? Miss Lucy, are you alright? Are you there, ma'am? Miss Westenra, did, did something break? Help! C- come in, please, come in. Oh, we thought we heard breaking glass. The mistress! Help me lift her. She's fallen on top of Miss Lucy. Are you badly hurt, miss? No, but my mother... It, it's too late. I, I think... There was a wolf that put its head through the window and she, she... She must have... It happened too quickly to help her. A wolf? It's not still here? It's run off. I, I don't know where it went. Will help me lay her on the bed? Of course, Miss Lucy. Now, you should go and have a glass of sherry to calm your nerves. You look shaken. I hate to leave you alone, miss. Please, I... I want a moment to collect myself. Of course. Wait, uh, please come back afterwards and stay with me. Yes, miss, of course. Alone with the dead, the air seems full of specks, floating and circling in draught from the window, and the lights burn blue and dim. I shall hide this paper in my breast where they shall find it when they come to lay me out. Goodbye, dear Arthur. If I should not survive this night, God keep you, dear, and God help me. What does it all mean? Was she or is she mad, or what sort of horrible danger is it? Arthur? Lucy, don't try to speak. Save your strength. He'll be here soon. We must send for Art. Will you need me for the next few minutes? No, you may send him a telegram. Indeed, I think there is no time to be lost. Such a fine morning for a walk. 
was a good idea to go out and see the city a little. I thought it might cheer us up to be out and about. Take both our minds off, well, everything. Cheers me up to see you getting some color back. Lately, I haven't had time to dwell, at least not in the past. The present, on the other hand. I know. I hate to think of when we will have to return to an empty house and call it our own. There are so many elegant people out. Look at that beautiful girl by the hat shop. Isn't she smart? But, uh, who's that man watching her? I don't like the way he's staring. He looks almost hungry. Oh, God! He's here! Uh, Jonathan, are you well? It's him! Mina, it's him! He still has the mark I gave him. Does he see us? Don't let him see you. Don't, don't let, don't let him look. Who, who is it? But you're trembling. Come, let's find a seat. Let's get away from here. He can't see us. He can't be here at all. But it was him. I swear it was him. Don't let him see us. Jonathan, my dear, don't distress yourself. Here, come lean on my arm. Come with me. Here's a bench. Let's sit a moment. You don't need to tell me anything. Was I dreaming? Oh, God. Am I going mad? I saw him, Mina. He was there. But I must have imagined it. He can't be here. He can't be. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. You don't need to explain. Just rest a moment. Lay your head on my shoulder. You're safe. I'm here. Oh, Jonathan. I don't know what to do. Should I read your journal and break that secrecy, that trust that I sealed away when we married? Sleep for now, darling, and I'll watch over you. I must read that diary. I must know, for if I don't know, I cannot help him. Mina? Was I asleep? I'm so sorry. I I don't know what came over me. It's such a warm day. I, I must have drifted off. It's all right, my love. Shall we take the next train back to Exeter and home? I don't need to rest. Really, I want to be at her side. My dear child, it is for her sake you must keep your strength. There are two sofas in this room, and you must lie on one of them for a time. Such sorrow has exhausted you no small amount. Is it all a terrible nightmare? First my father, then Lucy's mother? Now I dare not even think. It is a grief greater than you should have to bear. Rest now. And we will call for you when she awakes, or should there be a need. Thank you for all you've done for her. I'll, I'll stay here with you. Uh, Jax was Lucy, our hill watcher. Has she taken any food? Do you see any change at all? Little food, and she isn't breathing well or waking fully. She keeps clutching the flowers close to her, then throwing them away again like she's in a sort of trance. She seems stronger when she's asleep. Ah, look at her teeth. Her... oh... Yes. Have her gums drawn back. Or have her canines grown long and sharpened. That hardly seems possible. What does it mean? Let me see her neck. I must check on one thing. Those little wounds. They're gone. Yes. This is the undoing of our work. She is dying. It will not be long now. I should wake Arthur. I am sorry, Miss Lucy. I have tried all I knew. My dearest Lucy. Arthur, my love. Come here, Arthur, my love, and kiss me. Kiss me. No! Uh, What the... Uh, Sir, why do you prevent me from kissing her? Trust me, there are reasons which you shall know soon enough. Arthur, trust him. Professor, thank you. Don't let him come to harm. Promise me something, please. Protect him, and give me peace. I promise, if it is in my power to do so. Thank you. It is over. No, my friend, it is only beginning. All is ready for the burial of mother and daughter both. I hope that I did right in filling Mrs. Vestenra's death certificate in as heart failure. It does seem like that was the cause. This will prevent questions of a nature that we do not wish to answer. But as for Lucy, I am at a loss. All I know is that it was due to loss of blood over the course of several weeks. 
but I cannot account for how it was lost night after night. Can you not tell me your suspicions? You trust me. All these years, and even in these weeks, where there are many things you may doubt, there are strange and terrible days before us, will you have faith in me? Will you at least tell me why you have placed a wreath of garlic flowers in the coffin with her? Shh! Here comes the poor boy who must not be told of this. I will return to you soon, but first I have a visit to make, for there is one who may help us. Arthur. Jack, is she really dead? She almost looks... I know. How can it be that after wasting away so terribly, she she sees almost more alive than she did before? It happens sometimes that after suffering as she did, people gain a sort of peace after they die, as there is no more strain to keep living. You loved her too, old fellow. I can't think... How to thank you for all you've done. I don't know what I'll do without her. (laughs) Dr. Van Helsing, please come in. Thank you for inviting me here. My letter surprised you, Madam Harker? I cannot deny it, but... Sir, you can have no better claim on me than that you were a friend and helper of Lucy Westenra. I have read your letters to Miss Lucy. Forgive me, but I had to begin to inquire somewhere. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary, and in that diary she traces certain things to a sleepwalking in which you saved her. In great perplexity, then, I come to you and ask you out of your so much kindness to tell me all of it that you can remember. I can tell you all about it. Ah, then you have a memory for details. It is not always so with young ladies. But I wrote it down at the time, like the lady journalists advise. The details should be exact. You do me a great favor, if I may. You are welcome to read it, if you think it'll help. This will be a great... Oh, Madame Mina, you tease me, for I do not read shorthand. (laughs) You must pardon me, Professor. I only wanted to see whether you would understand it. Alas, you have mastered the skill which I have not. Please, have you a copy? Of course. In fact, I have made several. And Jonathan said that I might share his journal with you too. But I don't know that I should, except, well, I don't know who else to trust it with. If it were not for such great need, I would not ask it of you. But you may trust me. I will read and return to you. Read in here, and I will call for tea. Madame Mina, this journal is a sunshine. I had read your letters to Miss Lucy, but this knits together the lacunae. It was helpful to you then. That is a great relief. Since yesterday I've been in a sort of fever of doubt. I thought you might laugh when you came in here and read it. No, Madame Mina, if it's all known what I have thought and seen, it is you who would laugh. And, Jonathan, I feared you would think my husband a madman. He suffered another shock recently, and I'm afraid he has been set back by it. I'm I'm sorry, you must think me a weak fool. I don't cry this often, ordinarily. Professor, if there is anything you can do, any remedy you know to make my husband well, please, please tell me. I am sorry to be bringing such troubles upon you. I see that you have borne the strain of others suffering already. And yet I fear the truth may make worse the burden on you and your husband. It cannot be worse than not knowing. That was what made Jonathan think he was going mad. I do not wonder that he thought himself so. But tell me, how is he now? Has he regained his strength after the so great suffering he has passed through? He was almost recovered, but he has been greatly upset by Mr. Hawkins' death. It was a terrible blow, and then when we were in town on Thursday last, he had a sort of shock. A shock? And after brain fever so soon, that was not good. What kind of a shock was it? He thought he saw someone he recognized. Then he thought he was imagining things. Ah, I think that is not so, for I must tell you, Madame Mina, that strange and terrible as it may all be, everything in this journal is true. But then... That means such a monster exists, and he is in London. There is much in this which I must think on. What can I do? I must return to London. Take the 334 from Exeter. It should bring you directly to Paddington. Oh?
I have memorized every train timetable between here and London in case Jonathan should need to travel at short notice. Once again, you place me in your debt. I may call upon your help again and that of your husband if you will allow it. If there is any help we can offer, please consider us ready. Friend John, when you have finished dressing, come with me. We have much to speak of, and this evening we must go to the cemetery where Miss Lucy is buried and keep watch. What cause is there to watch? Ah, but you have not seen today's newspaper. Look. Hmm. The Hampstead Horror. Another child injured by some cause unknown who spoke of being enticed away by a woman they called the Bluefer Lady. I hardly see what relation this has to any of our sorrows these past weeks, though it seems like it isn't the only case. No, it is not. Now read on. It seems the child was found with two small puncture marks on the neck. Well, I can't think what to make of that, except that they sound very like those on poor Lucy's. And what conclusion do you draw? That they were made by the same thing that made the mark on Lucy. That is true, in some way, but not entirely. Must there still be concealment between us? Please, Professor, let me be your pet student again. Tell me your conclusions, or at least guide me to them. At the moment I feel like a madman, leaping from idea to idea like tussocks in a misty bog. There are strange things in nature, John. Terrible things. Great bats that suck the blood. Spiders that live for hundreds of years. Do you mean to say that... Some terrible bat is loose in London. Those marks were made by such a creature. No, it is much worse than that. What were they made by? They were made by Miss Lucy. Are you mad? Would I were. Madness were easier to bear than truth like this. But what proof have you of this? Why do you think I pulled her fiancé away and denied him even a final kiss? Why did I place garlic flowers in her coffin? And why now do I insist we watch in a graveyard in the dead of night? I, I cannot understand it. It has been done in many places to keep the dead from rising. You forget, my friend, that along with medicine, I have studied in many fields and in this so broad realm of knowledge, there are things that are not so easy to explain. Do you know all the secrets to life and death? No, but... My friend, let us not be two, but one. Let us work together. We will keep watch tonight, and tomorrow we must bring the others, Lord Godalming, and that fine young man from America... We must convince them, too, without saying all that we have done. We must only trust that they will believe what they see with their own eyes. I will come with you. But must we tell the others? It's only a week since Lucy was buried. Arthur cannot have recovered from the shock of her death. Must we subject him to further... to to this? Alas, yes. Ah, Friend John, I pity your poor bleeding heart. And I love you the more because it does so bleed. He must suffer much before all is done. But an end is before us, if I am not mistaken. If he know not, if he see not with his own eyes, but find out in some way what we have done, he will think that Miss Lucy was buried alive and that we have killed her. I believe Quincy has been staying with him. I'll ask them both to come here tomorrow, but I hardly know what reason to give them. And what do you mean, find out what we've done? Come to Kingstead Cemetery with me. You will see. Professor, Jack told me this was urgent. You are good to come so quickly. There is much to speak of. And it concerns... it concerns Lucy's death? Yes. You have found out what caused it? I have. But for you to believe, I will ask you to come with me to Kingstead Cemetery and to enter Lucy's tomb. What can you hope to do by intruding upon that hallowed spot? Why would you ask it of me? Miss Lucy is dead, no? Then there can be no harm to her. But if she be not dead... Good God! You mean to say she was buried alive? No. I mean to say that she is undead. I don't quite get your drift, Professor. What do you mean? Is this all a nightmare, or what is it? I I don't understand it either, but I was at the cemetery with the professor last night. We did... Forgive me, Arthur, but we did see something strange. What did you see? And why did you not tell me? 
Lucy's body was not in her coffin. You opened her coffin? By God, I have a duty to protect her tomb from desecration, and I will do it. You must come with us tonight, both of you. There are mysteries which men can only guess at, which age by age they may solve only in part. Believe me, we are now on the verge of one. Very well. I will come with you to the graveyard and and see what we must see. I'll come as well. This feels like a trespass to come at night. I am sorry for the need of it, but were I in doubt of my theory, I would not ask it of you. Indeed, that is why I have waited so long to speak of it to anyone save John. It is a horror that few should endure. Now, I will lift the lid of Miss Lucy's coffin, and you must see for yourself. (gasps) Steady, Art. Professor, I wouldn't ordinarily dishonor you by implying any kind of doubt, but this is a mystery that goes beyond honor or dishonor. Is this your doing? I swear to you by all that I hold sacred that I neither removed nor touched her. Two nights ago, when we came to keep watch... We both saw the coffin empty, and a figure moving amongst the gravestones. But that could have been a body snatcher. I thought the same at first, but the body was back in the coffin by the following day. I don't know what to make of it either. It was all quite difficult to explain. Another child has been injured in that time. If we do not act now, more will suffer. Professor, maybe I'm being hasty, but what's in that bag, and does it settle the undead, as you call them? I will tell you soon. Now watch. Look at what comes among the gravestones. But it's a child, and... and Yes, Lucy! Shh, it is her body, and yet not it. But wait a while, and you will see and know what she is. Ah, stay still, child. Don't move at all. Stay here. Arthur, dear, I see you hiding there. No. Lucy, how can you be here? Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others. Come with me now. Is this a phantom? Am I going mad? Do not listen to her, friend Arthur. John, see to the child, or it may be hurt. Come with me and we can rest together. My arms are hungry for you. See the blood on her mouth. She has fed tonight. Stay close, behind this crucifix, which will hold her back. We shall never be parted, my love. Remember her final words, my friend, to give her peace. She pleaded that I protect you. Do what you must. Go back into your Join tomb. Join me there, Arthur. Come with me. No. Back to your tomb. She has been made one of the undead. If this persists, she will make more, and many may share her fate. That child she fed upon tonight is in great danger. And you know how to stop that kind of monster? That wasn't Lucy. I have my guesses, as it has been done before, that is all. But we will take all possible precaution, for one of us must drive a stake through her heart, and then we must cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic. My God! I thought you were mad to ask this of us, but if you hadn't stopped that thing... Now we must move quickly. Quincy, you must stand guard with the crucifix. And what should I do? Will you wield the stake and free Lucy's soul from torment? I will do it. John, you have come back just in time. I brought the child to the hospital, but I didn't think I should stay to answer questions. Good. Take one of these stakes and be ready should that monster catch us unawares. The fiend is returning in Lucy's coffin. Will you wait until we are sure of its slumber? Then strike! The sun is rising. We don't have long before people might see us. We must make haste. If miss this chance, the undead will have another chance to feed. Then I must. Yes, I must. For the sake of her final request. (coughs) Forgive me, Lucy. Come on, Art. Let's get out of here. Now, my friends, one step of our work is done, one the most harrowing to ourselves. But there remains a greater task, to find out the author of all this our sorrow and to stamp him out. It is a long task and there is danger and pain. 
Shall we promise to go on to the bitter end? I promise this, for Lucy's sake. So do I. And I. Tonight, friend John, you will come with me, and Quincy and Arthur shall return to Ring. But in two days' time, we will meet for dinner and speak of the duty that lies before us. I will invite two others, those who have greater knowledge of the fiend we face. Dr. Seward, is it not? And you are Mrs. Harker. I knew you from poor dear Lucy's description. She often spoke of you as well, and with the greatest fondness. Will you let me take your case? Thank you. I hope it is not too forward of me, but I am anxious to learn of Lucy's last days. Learn of Lucy's death? Not for the world! I only meant that I might share in your sorrow and mingle my own with it. And I am willing to share the greater part of what I know, but, but there are some things... Well, we will talk of it soon enough. My journals, which Van Helsing has already read, are open to all of you. I hope that they may be of some help. Thank you. And so next we must find out where the Count has gone, but none of us have any idea. But we might know. When Jonathan was preparing for his trip, I helped him with some of his papers concerning Carfax Abbey, which the Count was preparing to buy. You mean Carfax Abbey that is just next door? I think it must be the same. (coughs) There is someone who may be able to tell us more of this. Yet he may not be willing to speak. I must see how he responds to the question of receiving guests. One of your patients? Well, yes. Though I will not say more until I know if he is willing to see strangers. Madame Mina, I rejoice that you have joined us. And your husband will be here tomorrow, as I hear? Yes, he's in Whitby now, searching for some records of the Count's movement since his arrival. You're Mina Murray, or rather... Harker. Lucy said you saved her once in Whitby. You must be Mr. Homewood. I'm sorry, Lord Godalming. If it's all the same to you, I'd rather not be reminded of the title just yet. It brings to mind that recent loss. But I know Lucy would have asked you to call me Arthur. Then I am pleased to meet you, Arthur. Quincy Morris, at your service, Miss Harker. And don't stand on ceremony, it's just Quincy. A pleasure. Lucy spoke highly of you. I spoke with Renfield, and he has agreed to see us. Indeed, he seemed rather keen to. I think it best that first you tell us all about your zoophagus patient. He is from an ancient and respectable family. They sent him to us when he became dangerous to others, due to his delusions having focused themselves into the point of acquiring more life. When did this begin? His records put it at a few months before he was admitted here, though it was not until a few months ago that he took to collecting and consuming living things. Since he arrived, he's attempted to escape and once managed it, running to the gate of Carfax Abbey. I thought at the time it was only because that was the nearest place. Perhaps we should compare the dates of the Count's activities with those of Mr. Renfield's escapes. And those of his attacks of violence or depression. First, let us speak with Mr. Renfield. Allow me to introduce you. Mrs. Harker, Lord Godalming. Professor Van Helsing, Mr. Quincy Morris of Texas, Mr. Renfield. Mrs. Harker, are you the girl the doctor wanted to marry? No, she's dead. He told so in his phonograph, didn't he? Lord Godalming, I knew your father and grieved to learn by holding the title that he is no more. Mr. Morris, Dr. Van Helsing, I am pleased to meet the men of whom Dr. Seward speaks so highly and who, in the latter case, I know by reputation and contribution to science. I didn't think you knew I wanted to marry anyone. (laughs) Poor doctor, so alone. Not much better off than I am. (laughs) I will tell you where it started, with a a story a friend told me. In the 17th century, three siblings led a cottage at Croglin in Cumberland, and while they stayed there, the sister was attacked by a creature that drank her blood. And later on, they tracked it to a graveyard, where it was found in one of the tombs. It was not dead, nor alive, and the woman's blood sustained it, when it should have decayed. The blood gave it life, and I let that thought consume me. Why have you never spoken of this before? What has it all to do with the Count? I can't speak of my lord and master to you. Tell me. Mrs. Harker, why are you here? My husband and I are friends of Dr. Seward's. Then don't stay. Why ever not? I can't tell you. There is something that stops my tongue like cold iron. None of you must stay here. 
Can you tell us more about the story you spoke of? I took the tale and I cogitated on it until it became an obsession and they put me here. Indeed, it is no wonder my friends become alarmed at my interest in consuming vitality, for I have attempted to take human life for the purpose. But I will say no more. It would be better for you not to stay. We must, for now at least, but I see it makes you uneasy to have me here, so I will leave you in peace. Good night, Mr. Renfield. Good night, and I pray you will go safely, and we will not meet again. Well, you seem to be feeling better than the last time we spoke. Maybe we should go too, Jack. Let Mr. Renfield get some sleep. Wait! What is it? I I wish you all to bear witness that I am a sane man in possession of my faculties, and as such... I ask that you let me go from here. I'll return in the morning for a longer chat. Perhaps something can be arranged. But you don't understand. I desire to go at once, here, now, this very hour, this very moment, if I may. I'm not at liberty to give you the whole of my reasons, but you may, I assure you, take it from me that they are good ones. Can you not tell frankly your real reason for wishing to be free tonight? I will undertake that if you will satisfy even me, a stranger with the habit of keeping an open mind, Dr. Seward will give you, at his own risk and on his own responsibility, the privilege that you seek. If I were free to speak, I should not hesitate a moment. Then we will wait until morning. Come, friends, we have work to do. Good night. If I am refused, the responsibility does not rest with me. Jack. I can't let him go where he might alert the Count. If you're sure... If we keep him here, at least we can observe what he does. Maybe even have some warning. Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward. Oh, uh, let me implore you to let me out of this house at once. Send me away, how you will and where you will, in a straight waistcoat, uh, manacled and leg ironed, even to a jail. You don't know what you do by keeping me here. By all you hold sacred, by all you hold dear, for the sake of the Almighty, take me out of this and save my soul from guilt. Can't you hear me, man? Don't you know that I am no lunatic in a mad fit, but a sane man fighting for his soul? Let me go! Let me go! Let me go! You must stay here tonight. Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. You will, I trust, Dr. Seward. Do me the justice to bear in mind, later on, that I did what I could to convince you tonight. You've just listened to the second episode of Dracula, a radio play, presented by the Pourquoi Pas Players and CHMR 93.5 FM. This episode featured Tim Murray as Jonathan Harker, Shannon Rogers as Mina Murray Harker, Lena Makaga as Lucy Westenra, Karen Murray Burquist as Dr. John Seward, James Din as Quincy Morris, Glenn Warren as Arthur Holmwood, David Hallett as Dr. Abraham Van Helsing, Kyle March McCush as Renfield, Scott Warsfold as Patrick Hennessy, Leah McDonald as Maid One, Lauren Andrews as Mrs. Westenra, Evan Maddock as Peter Hawkins, Holly Stack as Maid Two, Christina Acton as The Messenger, and Wilbur Helmer as Victoria the Brighton Line. This episode was written by Karen Murray Burquist based on the novel by Bram Stoker. Original music composed by James Den. This episode was edited by Christina Acton and directed by Hannah Tuck. Special thanks to Jasmine and Louisa Murray Burquist for script feedback and to Bob Earl and Rhea Rollman at CHMR for their support in this project. If you'd like to learn more about Pourquoi Pa and upcoming projects, why not follow us on social media? Find us on Facebook as Pourquoi Pa Players and on Instagram at P-O-U-R-Q-U-O-I-P-A-S Players. To join our mailing list, send us a message through Facebook, Instagram, or email us directly at P-O-U-R-Q-U-O-I-P-A-S Players at gmail.com. To re-listen to this episode, catch up on previous episodes, and hear bonus content, head to YouTube or Podbean and search for Pourquoi Pa Players. Thank you for listening, and stay tuned to CHMR 93.5 FM for more great local programming. <laughs>